on behalf of the Greater Boston Activities Committee and the Board of Directors of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. This is the second in the series of the Stephen P. Mugar Memorial Lectures on Modern Armenian History. Uh, this evening's lecture will be presented by Professor Ronald G. Suni of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. The topic of this evening's presentation is Soviet Armenia and the Diaspora, their roles and mutual responsibilities. Uh, we are happy to have a fine young scholar such as Professor Suni with us this evening. And your support and encouragement is essential to bringing to fruition the uh, dreams of the founders of our organization to see young scholars like Professor Suni and others who will be coming along mature, develop, and become true professionals. In order to see this process continue it requires your support, not only by your membership in Nasser and your participation in these events, but also through your contributions. I know that uh, these are difficult times for many of you financially, but uh, it's important that we set aside at least some portion of our uh, income to support worthy causes, and certainly we hope that you will consider Nasser as one of the worthy causes that you would consider to support. Uh, this evening, I would like to, before we get to our main speaker, introduce our chairman of the board of directors of Nasser, Mr. Manuk Young. Manuk. I just want to take a couple of minutes of your time to express to you our thoughts and our purpose in having these memorial lectures. For those of you who don't know, Stephen Mugar was one of the prime movers behind the success of the Harvard Chair Campaign of Nasser. He was the one that gave us the initial impetus financially in other ways that made it possible for us to go on to raise the money to establish the chair here at Harvard. In fact, there is a fund here at Harvard uh, in the name of his mother and father whose income goes towards the upkeep of the Harvard chair. Steve was a member of NASA for 25 years up until the time he passed away. He was a member of our board of directors for several years, and subsequently he was a member of our national advisory board, and in many other ways. He supported the organization, and after the Harvard chair campaign was concluded, he also contributed to our permanent endowment fund to set up a fund in the memory of his mother and father. And then when he passed away, we and the board felt that uh, it would be appropriate to have the name of that fund changed to include his name. So that we now have the Sarkis, Boskitel, and Stephen Mugar Fund for Armenian Studies. And not only did we change the name of the fund, but we also contributed $5,000 from unallocated other funds and put it into the Stephen Mugar, well, put it into the Mugar Fund. It is from the income of that fund that it has been possible to organize this lecture, or these series of lectures. However, the amount of money that we can make available from that fund is not sufficient to cover all of the expenses involved in putting out a series of lectures like this. There are certain rules and regulations that we are governed by insofar as the use of the income of the various permanent funds, permanent and memorial funds. 
and some of the expenses involved in the staging of a series like this cannot be allocated to the income from these endowment funds that we have. So that is why we have to charge admission, and that is why we hope that you will also contribute to help defray not only those expenses, but perhaps those of you who will so move will contribute directly to the Mugar Memorial Fund so that uh, that fund will grow and in the future we'll be able to continue to have these types of lectures. I don't know whether they were passed out to you, and if not, we'll pass them out to you when you leave. Uh, we have a yellow sheet here that you can in on which you can indicate what type of support uh, you would like to give, not only to Nasser, but also to the Mugab Memorial Fund. We're asking that you support this fund because we feel this is a way that we can thank Stephen Mugar for all that he did. Many of you are not aware that Steve was the kind of an individual who didn't want too much publicity made about a lot of the things that he did. And I personally know of many cases that Steve gave financial support, many projects that he gave financial support to and did not tell anybody about it or only very few people knew about it. There was no newspaper publicity or any other kind of publicity of that type. In fact, I would uh, dare guess that perhaps for every one thing that you heard him heard about him supporting, there probably were two or three other things that he gave to that you never heard about. And that was, the, that was Stephen Mugar, the man. And I think the item that I read in the Army Assembly newsletter best characterizes Steve Mugar. It is said that when he passed away and uh, they went through the contents of his wallet, they found this little slip of paper in there in which was inscribed the following words. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, as long as ever you can. This was what was found in his wallet. And I think that characterizes Steve better than anything else that I could say or anyone else could say. So we feel that if you're looking for a way to thank Steve Mugar for all he did for the Armenians in the many ways in which he helped, in the many known and the many unknown ways, you can contribute to the Mugar Memorial Fund and not only will you be thanking him, but you'll be making it possible for yourself to continue to benefit in this manner in these types of programs that we will organize through the income of this fund and other funds. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Ronald G. Suni. Dr. Suni received his master's degree and a certificate of the Russian Institute from Columbia University in 1965. Three years later, he earned his Doctor of Philosophy degree from Columbia. He's been a recipient of numerous graduate and postgraduate fellowships and awards, including a Fulbright grant for research in the Soviet Union in 1975-76. He's been a lecturer at Columbia University and a tenured professor of history at Oberlin College. He is now the first occupant of the Alex Manugian Chair of Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He's a prolific writer and lecturer on Soviet, Russian, and Armenian affairs. He's the author of The Baku Commune, 1917-1918, Class and Nationality in the Russian Revolution, published by Princeton University Press. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Ronald G. Suni. Thank you, Professor Karakasha, and thank you, Manuk Young. Thank you all for coming to hear me tonight. My topic which was assigned to me actually, not one chosen by myself, is a very challenging one and I hope I've risen to 
the challenge, though I must say at this point, before the lecture, I'm not so sure. The Armenian question in perspective is the general topic of the series. My assignment was Soviet Armenia and the diaspora, their roles and mutual responsibilities. <coughs> this is a very, very dangerous topic. And I'm going to tread lightly, and I hope uh, I will not offend any person of any political party here tonight as I try to trace this uh, particularly difficult and sensitive uh, question. When the Armenian question was first raised more than 100 years ago in international diplomatic circles, the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire and Tsarist Russia had not yet fully formulated a position on the future resolution of their political existence. There was not, a hundred years ago, general agreement on whether Armenia would be an independent sovereign republic or state, or whether Armenians would live in autonomous regions within distinct multinational empires ruled by the Turks and the Russians. It was only in the last decade of the 19th century that most of the liberal and radical Armenian leaders began to call for political autonomy within Turkey and Russia. And one small wing of the radical revolutionary movement, the Hunchak Party, came out unequivocally for national independence. There was for a long time the idea that Armenians would not live in an independent state, but rather political reality demanded that they stay within these separate empires. Now, since these bold declarations of intent so long ago, the history of Armenian political life has gone through more than one complete reversal. Whatever the aims of the Armenians themselves has been, the ambitions of the great powers has forced them to be modified. Massacres and revolutions in Turkey and Russia, a devastating campaign to eradicate Armenians from their historic homeland, all intervened to force Armenians to bargain for the best deal available. When World War, Russian Civil War, and Turkish National War came to an end, the only portion of the historic Armenian homeland under any kind of Armenian political control was that small corner of Transcaucasia which had come under Soviet power. There were now new terms under which the Armenian question would be asked in the 20th century. The question now would be, and it would be a very divisive question, was Armenia to be Soviet and tied to the fate of Bolshevik Russia, or was it possible at some future time for Armenians to be reunited and sovereign under another form of government? Now this choice for or against Soviet Armenia has been a very harsh and difficult one for most Armenians in the diaspora. The great majority of Armenians outside the homeland would probably have preferred some or any alternative to the radical and often harsh socialist regime which was established in Armenia late in 1920. Even Armenians who recognized that without Soviet rule and the protection offered by the Red Army, the Armenians may have ceased to exist on any portion of the Armenian plateau, even these have admitted that they would prefer a cultural and political distance from their brethren inside the Soviet Union. The major political party in the diaspora has engaged at different times after it had been displaced from government in Yerevan in more or less active resistance against the Soviet system. In recent years, the Dashnad Sutun has learned to accommodate itself to the persistence of Soviet authority, but that legacy of antagonism has hardly faded. Except for a small group of leftist sympathizers, most diaspora Armenians are still either embarrassed by the fact that Armenia is a Soviet Republic or try to avoid the political difficulties which this fact presents. Over the years, more and more segments of the community have actually made their peace with Armenia, in quotes, as it exists, without embracing the particular political form under which it's governed. It's come about in our own time that Armenians in the world remain divided. We are a small people, but we are broken into two nations. One, living within the Soviet Republic of Armenia with its own separate history, and the other, 
dispersed into dozens of communities in the Middle East, Europe, and America. When I was invited to speak to you this evening, my first thought was to try to relate, as well as one could briefly, the whole history of these two nations in the last 60 or 70 years. But that task is far too difficult, the story is too complex, and I've spoken at length on Soviet Armenia in lectures at Columbia, which will soon appear uh, in published form. I'm tempted to stay with the Soviet side, and I've, I've been trained as a historian of the Soviet Union, and it would be easier for me to tell the tale of Soviet Armenia. Without any great difficulty, I could give you one of those uh, lovely celebratory speeches, you know, the kind that are trotted out at Armenian Hanteses. You know them, you've heard them. I could recite to you the achievements of Soviet Armenia. I could tell you how from the darkest days after the genocide, Armenia rebuilt itself into a flourishing, productive republic, secure from outside attack because of Russian protection. I could tell you how many times agricultural and industrial production has risen since 1920. I could remind you about the cultural advances, the strides made in education, in the arts. I could do this very easily. In fact, I've made such speeches many times. I've enjoyed making them. I don't regret that at all. The achievements of Soviet Armenia are real. As an Armenian, I'm proud of them. They deserve to be uh, periodically noticed and admired. If I were going to make such a speech, I'd sprinkle it liberally with statistics. Uh, since 1913, the number of kilowatt hours of electricity, for instance, has increased from less than 5 million per year to over 2 trillion. This could get rather dull. And probably I'd finish up with a verse from Charense's patriotic poem, Yes Im Anush Hayastani. But I've decided against that this evening. I've decided instead of looking at Soviet Armenia, I'd like to look at us Armenians who live outside of Armenia, particularly those of us who live in the United States. I have long thought that the Armenians in the diaspora are in a very precarious situation at this moment. I believe, despite appearances, that these are very hard times to be an Armenian. Now this may strike you at first to be a rather odd thing to say, in 1983, after all, at few other times in our long history have Armenians had a more secure and relatively prosperous state of their own. Seldom in the past could so many Armenians in the diaspora count themselves so fortunate materially. Yet, if we consider for a moment that several centers of Armenian life in the Middle East, thinking of Beirut, Istanbul, Tehran, Baghdad, are undergoing a destructive process of transformation, it becomes clear that for many Armenians around the world, this is indeed a most menacing time. The most important Armenian community outside the Soviet Union, that in Beirut, has suffered the dislocation and pain of the Lebanese civil war and the recent Israeli invasion. Armenians in that once effervescent commercial capital have been forced either to take sides in the military confrontation between Muslims and Christians or to attempt to hold on to a fragile uh, neutrality or to leave their country and emigrate westward. As you well know, it's out of that divided and politically active community that the newest and most violent of Armenian political movements has come. The Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia. A group of young people who have challenged the rhetoric of other and older Armenian nationalists with a bloody propaganda of the deed as they launched attacks on Turkish diplomats in Europe. The recent series of armed assaults, even in the incomplete and distorted way they've been presented in the American media, have, it seems to me, had two major repercussions. First of all, they have riveted non-Armenian attention on the Armenian question and they have compelled an indifferent public, both Armenian and Otar, to take notice of a historical injustice. Secondly, they have confronted Armenians with the uncomfortable fact that a small group of young Armenians has been so driven by the failure of older people to take action to resolve Armenian territorial claims that they themselves would take up the most desperate and dangerous form of political action, terrorism. Civil war in Lebanon, military repression in Turkey, 
Muslim fundamentalist reaction in Iran and the radical response of militant young Armenians have dramatically changed the prospects for the Armenian diaspora. That kind of gradual building of communities in the Middle East in which Western Armenians engaged after the genocide of 1915 now seems to many not to have much of a future in an age of rising Muslim uh, nationalism and the collapse of pro-Western parliamentarianism. What kind of a role are Armenians going to play in Khomeini's Islamic Republic? Is there much of a future for Armenians in a Turkey where a cabal of generals has decreed the abolition of political parties at one point only to write, revive them later? Can Armenians can be complacent about the possibilities of life in Egypt or Iraq or Jordan? I'm a historian and I'm reluctant to try to predict what might happen to Armenians in the future, but current trends seem to indicate that Middle Eastern Armenians are entering a lengthy period of uncertainty, of political instability, and possibly even of revolutionary change. This instability and danger stands in stark contrast to the situation of Armenians in the two other major centers of Armenian life, and in my view, the two centers which will be the beacons for the future life of Armenians. And they are, of course, in the United States and in the Soviet Union. And yet, though the danger of economic collapse or civil war may seem far from American or Soviet Armenians, I would warn that these more secure communities are faced with their own peculiar dangers in the early 1980s. Throughout the long history of our people, Armenians have only uh, briefly enjoyed a united political existence. More common in experience has been division and disunity, occupation of the homeland by enemies, and dispersion of Armenians around the globe. Today we are again divided, most fundamentally between those Armenians who live in Armenia and those who live abroad. This division is much deeper than mere geography or dialect. It is a division of deep political, social, and cultural differences. Armenia, we must realize, and probably do realize, is as different from us as any place on earth. And yet we still think, somehow, that we are the same people ethnically, and we cling to a shared belief that we have a common heritage and a common future. As I mentioned, it's been difficult for American Armenians to reconcile them to the, themselves to the fact that Armenia is part of that other great superpower, the one that stands opposed to the United States. And we're very confused about the attitude we should adopt towards Soviet Armenia. I remember once, I think about a year ago, I was uh, invited to speak uh, to a celebration in Detroit. It was called the 61st anniversary of the rebirth and renaissance of our ancestral homeland, Armenia. Well, that's a very beautifully phrased, carefully formulated expression. Of course, Armenia is not 61 years old, but more like two and a half millennia old. Uh, Armenia, in fact, uh, was, of course, Soviet Armenia, but they avoided using the word Soviet. Now, in the past, Armenians in the diaspora have been divided among one organized segment which was vehemently opposed to Soviet Armenia, I would say uncritically hostile, unwaveringly hostile. And another, and there was such a group, now largely defunct, that was uncritically supportive of Soviet Armenia. A group that developed in the 20s and 30s and then disappeared in the Cold War. The diaspora was split between these, imp these implacably hostile elements and the almost romantically attached with a large middle group sitting it out on the sidelines. What I'm going to argue tonight is that this split can be reconciled and that if we take a brief look at the history of Armenian, diaspora Armenian relations and attitudes towards Soviet Armenia, we might be able to find possible 
alternatives to these dichotomous views uh, uh, that Armenians in the diaspora held. Let's look, and I, I don't wish to bore you, but I think we should go a little bit systematically through the history of the last six or seven decades and try to evaluate the costly intracommunal struggles that have taken place among Armenians over the principal issue of relations with Soviet Armenia. This exercise that I'm about to embark on, as I mentioned, is a dangerous one. One, because it, is, it touches very real sensitivities of people in the diaspora. And two, because for myself, it is not my own area of expertise. There are people in this audience and in the Armenian communities in this country who know various aspects of this history far better than I. And I welcome, during the question and comment period after my talk, additions, comments, helpful suggestions, uh, even uh, bitter uh, reproaches. The sources of division between East and Western Armenians go back far beyond uh, the controversy between Bolsheviks and Dashnaks. If you go back into the 19th century, you'll find that two communities were developing, one largely around the western, uh, the Turkish city of the capital of Constantinople, Istanbul, the other in Transcaucasia, largely centered in Tiflis. Two different political and intellectual cultures were, were developing in these two centers. In western Armenia, in Istanbul particularly, the educated classes sent their children to western Europe, to France, to Italy, uh, for further education. There was uh, much interest in Western romantic literature, uh, in Western science. Uh, the uh, 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 Mukhtarist influence was extremely strong in the Western communities. In the East, on the other hand, in Tiflis, or Baku, or Nornachichevan, in Caucasian and Russian, among Caucasian and Russian Armenians, the intellectual traditions were quite different. They were much more influenced, as you might imagine, by Russian schooling, by the Russian radical revolutionary tradition, populist and later Marxist, and the schooling there, if you went for further education, it's likely that you'd go to Moscow or Petersburg or Dorpat, which is now in Estonia, German, or even to Germany, Northern European education. And each community, as those of you uh, uh, older in our audience remember, I'm sure, felt that it was superior to the other, and that those who said Sirumem were speaking a different and, in fact, inferior Armenian from those who said Gesirem. And neither seared the other very much anyway. <laughs> this conflict between uh, uh, these two communities uh, continued through the period of the independent Armenian Republic to the ridiculous degree that when Armenians went to be represented at the Paris Peace Conference, they of all nations, great and small, had to be represented by two delegations. One from Eastern Caucasian, Dashnak, Republic Armenia, and the other by the Western Armenians uh, led by uh, Boros uh, Nubar Pasha. Uh, finally, under the uh, pressure of the Catholicos, the two delegations merged into one. To add to this Eastern and Western division, there was a long conflict between the Dashnak Tsuchun, which was the major, most important uh, Armenian political party, both in the Caucasus and Turkey, and on one hand, on the left, uh, the Dashnak enemies, the Marxists, Social Democrats, Hunchaks, Armenian Marxists of various kinds, those who would eventually become Bolsheviks and take over Armenia, so there was no love lost there. And on the other hand, the Dashnaks were equally antagonistic toward and received the hostility of the Armenian middle class, who they often terrorized into subsidizing uh, their cause, not in the nice way that Manuk did tonight, but uh, by armed terror and actually murdering uh, uh, recalcitrant uh, and stingy middle class Armenians. Uh, and they, of course, didn't like very much the liberal parties, the cadet party, uh, what later became the Ramgavar party. Now in 1920, late in 1920, to be exact, on December 2nd, 1920, as Turks were moving into uh, Dashnag Armenia from one end, the Red Army standing on the border on the other, at the other end, the Dashnag government uh, signed 
over uh, its uh, powers to a, a Bolshevik or communist Soviet government. When the communists moved into Armenia, they were already the allies of the Kemalist Turks. This, of course, again, was a point of antagonism between the communists and the Dashnangs. Secondly, the communists had made agreements with the Dashnangs that there would be a coalition government in, in the new Soviet Republic and that Dashnangs would not be persecuted. These various agreements were broken by this young, militant, uh, quite inexperienced uh, communist government and Dashnag leaders were arrested and the agreements broken. As you probably remember from your own reading of Armenian history in February 1921, as the Red Army moved out of Yerevan towards Tbilisi to liberate, quote unquote, Georgia from the Mensheviks, the Dashnags uh, revolted against the Bolsheviks and briefly restored their rule. It lasted a few months. They were then chased through Zangizur into Persia. After that point, the Dashnags became the major anti-communist, anti-Soviet political movement among Armenians outside and to some extent within Soviet Armenia. At the same time, within Armenia, the communists, influenced by Lenin's new turn to the new economic policy, began to develop more moderate, less uh, anti-nationalist policies toward the nationalities and towards the Armenians themselves. It's interesting to note that within a few months of the Dashnag defeat and exile, there were attempts to reconcile Soviet and Dashnag uh, parties. In July 1921, three Armenian Revolutionary Federation delegates met with three representatives of the Soviets in Riga. And they agreed there that the Soviets would push Armenian claims in Turkey. That is, the Soviets would become the instrument to develop the Armenian question. And then the Dashnaks on their side uh, would adopt a more friendly posture toward the Soviets. But this agreement failed because neither the ARF Bureau nor the Soviet government would ratify the agreement. Now in the 1920s, because of Lenin's policy of support for the anti-imperialist struggles of, Muslim, of the Muslim East, Soviet Armenia was forced to give up its claims to Turkish Armenian territory. And both the 1921 treaties of Kars and of Moscow established a frontier with Turkey, largely the frontier, or the frontier exactly which exists today, which gave to the Kemalist Turks, Kars, Ardahan, perhaps most painfully, Mount Ararat, the ancient capital, medieval capital of Armenia, Ani, as well as the rest of Western Armenia. Thus, the Treaty of Sev, the treaty which had granted a large Armenia within, uh, uh, combining Turkey and the Caucasus, uh, was rejected. Now this Soviet position, adopted in 1921, on the territorial question that we do not have claims against Turkey, as well as the domestic transformation which the Soviets were undertaking within Armenia, attacks on religion, attacks on non-Soviet or anti-Soviet political movements, attacks on the patriarchal family, on the subordinate role of women, on many of the traditional aspects of Armenian life. This anti-nationalism, as it was perceived by the Tashnags, pushed the Tashnag party into a vehement, often violent opposition to the communist government. Most Armenians in the West, in the 1920s and in the Middle East, were far too involved with creating new communities in exile to be bothered with what was going on in Soviet Armenia. If you think about the generation of, uh, of the 1920s, still licking their wounds, trying to find their brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers after the genocide, trying to learn new languages, build churches, engaging in Near East relief, trying emotionally and psychologically to distance themselves from the genocide. For them, there were life and death questions, questions of survival and renewal, and there was not much time for most Armenians to concern themselves with Soviet Armenia. There were some, 
Indeed, there were small groups of supporters, some ex-Dashnads, like my own grandfather, Greek or Sunni, who became unequivocal supporters of Soviet Armenia, who joined fledgling Armenian communist parties or communist cells, or such front organizations as the HOK, the High Oknutian Komite, and tried in a variety of ways to help this poor little struggling country as they envisioned it uh, in the Caucasus. My grandfather, I was, I've been told, uh, bought with a few, uh, the little money he made uh, as a musician, you know, there wasn't a lot of money in Armenian music in America, you can imagine, in the 1920s. There isn't much anymore either, still. Uh, buying used instruments, repairing them, and then mailing them to Armenia. And I've seen the instruments uh, in, in, in the Armenian Conservatory. My father remembers in the late 20s selling Soviet Armenian candy. Soviet Armenian candy. Uh, what he couldn't sell to uh, hostile Dashna storekeepers, he would sell, he told me, to sympathetic uh, Jewish merchants. <laughs> but these were a few, a few people. Uh, they were communists, that is, they thought they were Marxists. My own feeling is, uh, they sincerely believe that, my own feeling is they were communists because Armenia was communist. That they were, in a sense, sort of nationalists with a little uh, pink uh, coloration. Now, another problem for diaspora Armenians was that Soviet Armenia, as I mentioned, had accommodated itself to Kemalist Turkey. That there was a friendly relation between the Kemalist Turks, uh, who were held by most diaspora Armenians to have been responsible in some sense for the genocide and the post-genocide massacres. At the same time, the United States of America, which earlier had been hostile to the Turks, critical of the genocide uh, policies, etc., began to take a more accommodationist line towards Turkey. In 1923, at the Lausanne Conference, while other Western powers supported a position for an Armenia, a, a, a Armenian entity within Turkey, the United States, which was just an observer, not a signator to the Lausanne Treaty, in return uh, for receiving oil concessions from Turkey, uh, essentially supported the Turkish position, that there would be no independent Armenia apart from the Soviet Republic. Some years later, in 1927, the U.S. Department of State, which still to this day does not have a very reputable uh, record on the Armenian question, just read that bulletin that came out last year uh, about the alleged massacres, the alleged genocide. The U.S. Department of State on November 29, 1927, declared that there was no such country as Armenia, that the former Armenian Republic had been divided between Russia and Turkey. In the 20s, the Dashnag party regrouped after its defeat in the Caucasus, uh, reissued its old magazine, uh, newspaper, Droshak, uh, and tried in a variety of ways to uh, defeat, or at least limit the influence of the Soviet Armenian government. On the other side, the Armenians in Armenia and the uh, Soviet government in general attempted to establish ties with the West and to attract them to Hayastan. And they have a number of incidents where Soviet Armenian officials would go to France, uh, which recognized Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union in 1924, and give public lectures and encourage repatriation to Armenia. Indeed, many writers and artists like Shirvan Zadeh, the sculptor-painter Ara Sarkisyan, writers Zaba Eseyan, Yervan Tolayan, returned to Armenia. And the humanitarian and Nobel Prize winner Frijif Nansen worked on a project in those years to resettle Armenians in Armenia. Uh, little came of it, but the efforts were made. Now, as we move from the 20s into the 1930s, we go into a much darker period of the experience of Soviet Armenia. Without going into a lot of detail, let me emphasize the sort of basic uh, dichotomy that existed in the 20s. On one hand, in the West, there was a growing sympathy, particularly among intellectuals, and by the way, Armenian intellectuals as well, towards the Soviet experiment in industrialization, collectivization, state building, etc. 
That is, there was a growing intellectual romance with an imagined Soviet reality. At the same time as this was occurring, as this sort of fellow traveler experience was occurring, as one by one uh, nations like the United States in 1933 recognized the Soviet Union, began trading with the Soviet Union, as the Soviet Union became one of the most important anti-fascist and anti-Nazi powers uh, and thereby recruited and won over much sympathetic progressive, so-called progressive uh, feeling as this was happening in the West. The reality in the Soviet Union was that a harsh authoritarian, if you like, totalitarian regime was being established. That instead of a democratic socialism in which the workers owned, managed the means of production and ran the state, a harsh police dominated political system was being established which would result in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people through the collectivization, through demographic displacement, and through the great purges of 1936 through 1938. And so here you have this odd situation in the 30s, where on the one hand, the West, is there is growing sympathy for the Soviet Union, and on, in part of the Armenian community, and part of the uh, Western intellectual community, and on the other hand, the Soviet Union is becoming a much more intolerant, a much a, a country in which nationalism or any suggestion of uh, nationalism is being ruthlessly persecuted. A country in which not only anti-communists, but communist leaders themselves are, are murdered by other communists. The head of the Communist Party of Armenia, Aghazi Khanjan, was murdered uh, by, it is, I think, fairly certain at the moment, uh, Beria, the head of the Transcaucasian Party. His successor, a man named Amatuni, also disappeared in the purges, as did the whole generation of Armenian Leninists who had, who had led Armenia through the 20s. Sarkis, Ger Gabrielian, Katsian, etc., etc. While this was happening in the West, the Hawk was increasing uh, in its popularity, uh, though it was attacked by various governments, it was disbanded by the government of France in 1934. A communist front party was, was organized, uh, the Haraj Dimakan, or Progressive Party. There was a Garmir Khach, a Red Cross, which was Garmir in more ways than its name might suggest. There was even a fashion, which some of you may remember, among these progressive uh, pro-Soviet Armenians, of having, instead of religious weddings, red weddings, red christenings, and even red funerals. And so there was this romance with the Soviet Union at the same time as the reality, which people did not know much about, uh, was quite uh, horrible. It's in that context of the, the dichotomy, the split between of the reality and the image of the Soviet Union that the tensions within the Western Armenian communities uh, deepened uh, and increased. After the United States recognized the USSR in 1933, the Armenian Church in America, the official established Armenian Church in America, began to take an increasingly sympathetic position towards Soviet Armenia, not just the church in Armenia, but the Soviet state as well. This was done subtly, but it was done. Archbishop Devon Turian refused in 1933, in July of 1933, you all I'm sure are familiar with this incident, refused to speak at an Armenian Day celebration at the Chicago World's Fair because on the stage was placed the tricolor uh, Tashnag Republican flag. He said the flag of Armenia is now a red flag and he wouldn't speak and the ceremonies were canceled. For his action in support of the Soviet Armenian government, Turian on August 2nd was beaten uh, by a group of young uh, Dashnak sympathizers. On September 1st, when the Diasian Convention was held in New York, Dashnak supporters uh, held a majority in the convention and the uh, third who supported the Archbishop were forced to withdraw to the Hotel Martinique to set up a separate uh, church 
uh, uh, organization. And thus, two churches, uh, one pro-Tashnag and sympathetic, uh, and uh, hostile to the Soviet Union, and one pro Etchmiadzin uh, and more uh, sympathetic uh, to uh, Soviet Armenia uh, existed. The Katholikos in Armenia, by the way, no friend of the Soviet regime, Katholikos Khoren, who himself would uh, a few years later be strangled uh, by NKVD agents, ruled that it was the Turian faction the, uh, that was the rightful church in Armenia, in America, and that the Tashnag faction were usurpers. A few months later, on December 25th, 1933, Christmas Day, Archbishop Turian was assassinated in Surbhach Church in New York. Next, the year, next year, nine Tashnag party members were tried and found guilty of this murder. Whatever the reality of this situation was, whether or not this murder was ordered by the Tashnag party, who by the way officially uh, rejected any connection, Whatever the reality, this, these events of 1933-1934 irrevocably to our present time for 50 years divided the Armenian community in America. There was a boycott of Tashnags by non-Tashnags. Cousins and brothers did not speak to each other. <coughs> to some extent the party declined in the second half of the 1930s uh, because of their identification with this uh, assassination and also because of the growing rapprochement between the United States and the USSR and because of popular front uh, policies of the Communist Party. This intellectual flirtation with the Soviet Union. Efforts by Etchmiadzin and Katholikos Khoren to end the schism were to no avail. A Bishop Karekin Hovsepian was sent in 1936 to America as the new prelate, but he was unable to end the schism. In June of 1941, the Soviet Union was invaded by Nazi Germany. Overnight, Stalin and Churchill became allies. And within half a year, the United States had joined the military effort against fascism. For the next four years, <clears throat> anti-Soviet propaganda was quieted in the West, and the Soviet media hailed the freedom-loving nations of the Grand Alliance. The Dashnak Party, while remaining dedicated to the destruction of Soviet rule, and as they called it, the liberation of Armenia and the reunion of Turkish and Russian Armenia, nevertheless maintained a high degree of silence during the war years. A small right wing of the Dashnak Tsutyun in Europe split off and actively joined the Nazis in their war efforts on the Soviet Union. Again, the community was divided, but the majority of Armenians supported the Allied war effort against uh, Nazism. And because so much of that war effort was led by the Soviet Union, who by the way, almost single-handedly in the continent of Europe, defeated the Nazi war machine, you know that 20 million Soviet citizens were killed uh, in uh, World War II as compared to 300,000 Americans on all fronts. This was a, a mammoth effort, an enormous effort. Um, uh, because of this, the Soviet Union uh, gained during the war years an image of heroism. And many Armenians flocked to the uh, Armenian left. Within Armenia, by the way, Armenia did suffer during World War II tremendously. Soviet Arme though Armenia itself was never invaded by the Nazis, Soviet Armenians lost about 12% of their population, 174,000 people, mostly men obviously, between 1941 and 1945. It's an enormous, enormous demographic loss in that short time. Well, during the, this alliance with the Soviet Union, during the heyday of the uh, uh, sort of Uncle Joe spirit, when Stalin was everybody's friend, uh, this was the height of the influence of the Haraj Dimakan, the Hunchaks, and so forth. Uh, and the, these groups, Hunchaks, Ramkavars, Haraj Dimakans, joined in a kind of popular or national front. 
This was the period of John Roy Carlson's Undercover, a book which uh, 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 attacked the Dashnags as Nazi sympathizers. And within Armenia, the accommodation was made between the Soviet government and Armenian nationalism and the church. During the Second World War, the Armenian government, uh, the Soviet government, allowed churches to be reopened in Armenia, brought back exiled clergymen from Siberia, created a council of ecclesiastical affairs in Soviet Armenia, and on April 19, 1944, Stalin himself received the head of the Armenian church, uh, the acting Catholicos, he wasn't Catholicos, Kevork uh, Cherekchan uh, in the Kremlin. And he permitted uh, the Armenians to reopen the seminary in Etchmiadzin and reestablished a printing press. In June of 1945, sort of the height of this Soviet uh, Armenian and pro Soviet feeling, in June of 1945, uh, the Soviet government permitted the election of a new Catholicos. This was clearly a conciliatory gesture by the USSR to permit. Uh, election, and uh, that they, an election that they had prevented since 1938. Clergymen were invited from the West, and this, re this conclave of, uh, of 1945, I would say, represents the zenith of the closeness between the diaspora Armenians and Soviet Armenia. The Katharagos was now allowed to live again in Etchmiadzin. He had been forced to live in Yerevan, a uh, new paper, magazine, Etchmiadzin was allowed to be published by the Catholic State, etc. About this time, in June of 1945, the new Catholicos, Kevork VI, sent a series of messages to Stalin, urging him to, one, allow the repatriation of diaspora Armenians to Soviet Armenia, and secondly, to permit the return to Soviet Armenia uh, of territory in Turkey and to force the Turks to pay reparations to the Armenian people. The Catholicos wrote with the support of the conclave which had elected him, and I quote, the Armenian people are firmly convinced that the great Russian people will aid them in realizing their patriotic and humane aspirations of recovering their national patrimony, unquote. This event now, interestingly enough, initiated by the Armenians was the beginning of a new relationship between diaspora and Soviet Armenia, a joint effort to realize and solve the Armenian question in a particularly coordinated way. With, with repatriation would arise the need for the return of territory in Turkey to Armenia. And thus, with this one policy of calling for repatriation, you also were making the demand for territory. For only by solving the problem of irredenta, of lost territory, uh, would you solve uh, the repatriation problem, the fears of dearmonization, of the loss of national feeling in the diaspora, etc. This repatriation campaign and the Soviet claims to Kars and Ardahan were supported by the Armenian church, both in and outside of Armenia, by the Ramgavar party with its financial support. It's a small party, but it uh, represents this sort of financial section of the Armenian people. By the Hunchak party, sort of a rump Marxist party left over. And by a variety of special committees and organizations. Even the Tashnag Suchun joined in this campaign for repatriation, though the party, because of its former and continuing hostility to the Soviet Union was excluded from the many political organizations which existed. And a campaign began. And from 1946 through 1948, about 102,000 Armenians, uh, about 9% of diaspora Armenians left their exiled communities and returned to Soviet Armenia. Now it's interesting who these Armenians were. Very few came from America, very few from Western countries. More than 90% of these repatriates had originally lived in some part of Armenia, in Turkish Armenian Cilicia, perhaps even in the Caucasus. These were the survivors of the genocide or children of the genocide survivors who wanted to go back to their remembered homeland. 80 to 
of the immigrants came from the Middle East, from Greece, where about only 50% of the diaspora lived. The first year was the big year. A year, remember, that Armenia and Soviet Union was still an ally of the West. 51,000 returned. In 1947, about 35,000. By 1948, only 16,000. Now, along with this repatriation, the Soviet Union began to defend the claims to Armenian territory. On June 7, 1945, Molotov wrote to the Turkish ambassador, Sarberi, and demanded changes in the boundaries uh, of Armenia and Turkey, and, and demanded back the areas of Kars and Ardahan. Um, and these efforts were supported by uh, the Armenians in the West, large parts of the Armenians in the West. Now, several things happened. As we move from 1945, we are, of course, entering a new period of Armenian history, the end of the wartime alliance and the beginning of the Cold War. And during the Cold War, lines hardened between the Soviet Union and the United States and Britain, on the other hand. And as it turned out, this demand by the Soviet Union for territory in Turkey was interpreted by the West as an aggressive and expansionist act, along with their claims to Eastern European territory and Iranian territory, etc. And the West supported Turkey in its resistance to Soviet demands. That's the first point. Secondly, the whole affair was botched up by the Soviets when they decided in 1947, oh, that territory, Karsten Artahan, should be returned to its rightful owners, Georgia. Suddenly, Vyshinsky announced at the UN on October 27, 1947, that the land was Georgian. This may have been influenced by uh, Stalin's uh, Georgianness, obviously, and Stalin's advisor, Beria, and I urge you to look at Khrushchev's memoirs on that question. And so the link suddenly between Armenian repatriation and Armenian claims to land in Turkey was severed by the Soviet Union's own uh, pronouncement. Disillusionment spread, within the Armenian community, and the repatriation drive uh, petered out. The old enthusiasm for the Soviet Union was already dissipating as a result of Cold War rhetoric and the new antagonism in the West towards our former allies. By 1952, America was leading an alliance against uh, a, a, a Stalinist Soviet Union, which was perceived as the greatest uh, threat to Western democracy and capitalism. And who should join that alliance in 1952 but Turkey uh, herself? It's not surprising that in this period of the Cold War, the old influence of Haraj Dimakans of the Armenian left began to dissipate as one by one these organizations were persecuted, put on indexes, uh, uh, investigated, or as in France, actually disbanded by the government. Uh, and in this period, the Cold War rhetoric of the American uh, media and of the Western uh, uh, communities was now reproduced in the Dashnag uh, press. It is at the end of the Cold War period, in 1955-56, that two elections were held for Catholicos. One in Echmiadzin, where Vasken I became head of the Armenian Church uh, 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 head of uh, the uh, uh, Catholic state of all Armenians, as it's called. And after that, uh, in Antilias, where a anti uh, uh, uh candidate, Zarya I, was elected despite the efforts of Vasken. Vasken was condemned in the Tashnag press as a Soviet agent, as a mouthpiece for the Kremlin and the KGB. Cold War in time gave way to what we, can, we first used to call coexistence and later detente. Contacts in the late 1950s and early 60s increased between the United States and the USSR. And for the first time in almost 30 years, it became possible for Armenians in America to travel to Yerevan and to see for themselves the social transformation, the cultural strides, and the scars that had been made 
in the long period of Soviet development and Stalinism. What many Armenians saw was that a country which had been described as a land of stalking death and disease in 1920 had emerged 30 years later as an urban and industrial state well on its way to European modernity. The fear that Armenians were losing their national identity under a Russifying policy of the Soviet government could be laid to rest as it became abundantly clear to anyone who looked around Yerevan that the end of Stalinism had eliminated the worst excesses of anti-nationalism. With more contact in the 60s came more understanding and a much more complex appreciation of both the progress made in Soviet Armenia and the limits imposed on Armenians by the communist government. In the West, even the most implacable enemies of Soviet Armenia uh, began to moderate their opposition and to shift their attacks away from the Soviets and toward that more ancient enemy of the Armenians, the Turks. It actually seemed by the end of the 60s and the 1970s that the political normalization between the United States and the Soviet Union would provide new possibilities for cultural exchanges and travel between the superpowers, a development which could potentially resolve the ambivalence that diaspora Armenians felt about their national homeland. And one should think about the last 20 years of our diaspora existence. Hasn't it been true that as the rhetoric of the Cold War dissipated, the possibility for bringing the two parts of our nation, Soviet and diaspora together, or closer at least, has increased, and this has had an enormous effect within diaspora communities themselves, where the old lines of division and hostility have begun ever so gradually to melt away. And so we have begun to do in the last couple decades what was impossible four or five decades ago, to create organizations uh, where both sides, or all sides, could sit together and work. I'm thinking of things like the Armenian Assembly or uh, some of our scholarly organizations like the Society for Armenian uh, Studies, Nasser, etc., etc. The detente period then, it seems to me in retrospect, was a period of hopefulness for the healing of wounds and the creation of a new rapprochement between the two parts of our nation, Soviet and Diaspora. But history is a fickle and unpredictable companion. And instead of steady improvement of Soviet Arme American relations, the era of detente collapsed very quickly. First with the hard line taken by President Carter, particularly after the invasion of Afghanistan, and later with the escalation of anti-Soviet rhetoric by the current administration. The always cool relations between the superpowers chilled rapidly, and commentators began to speak about a second Cold War. We live today in a period where Soviet and American relations are at a new historic low. Armenia is, of course, I don't need to tell you this, a very small nation. The smallest republic in the Soviet Union, and we Armenians make up an infinitesimally small portion of the world's population. So we like to think, uh, at the same time, that we are probably the most important portion. <laughs> small nations such as ours are usually the victims of the needs and ambitions of larger powers. But I'd like to conclude by saying this, that it seems to me that Armenians have their own interests. And we are able, under certain circumstances, to promote those interests. In recent years, American Armenians have come to do much to organize in order to promote their own notion of what is good for Armenians, to protest the silence, for instance, surrounding the historical record of 1915, to agitate for the recognition of Armenian claims to lands now lying under Turkish control. And yet, Armenians have been extremely reluctant to deal with broad issues of international policy. While the state of Soviet-Armenian relations has always, as I've tried to show in this lecture, had some bearing, good or bad, on the present and on the future of Armenians, we Armenians have not chosen to organize around this question of East-West competition 
or cooperation. Here, however, I submit is an issue of vital importance, not only to Armenian survivor rival, but to our future as Americans as well. I believe that a new Cold War would in no way be helpful to Armenian Americans. A renewal of deep suspicions and open antagonisms between the superpowers only divides Soviet Armenians from diaspora Armenians. It makes it impossible for us in America to work together with Armenians in the Soviet Union to develop our mutual culture. The delicate network of cultural exchanges, of travel back and forth to Yerevan, which has only existed for two and a half decades, could very easily be destroyed. Do we really want a future in which we will be cut off once again from the center of our national civilization, from the holy see of Etchmiadzin, from the repositories of our manuscripts, from our ancient monuments? Does it not seem self-evident that division and conflict between the two parts of our nation only weaken us as a people? If this is so, then it follows that Armenians have an interest in working for the maximum understanding and cooperation possible between the two great powers which hold a portion of our national survival in their hands. Armenians in America must define, I would argue, our own attitude toward the Armenian Republic in the Soviet Union. We must neither be dragooned by American needs into an anti-Soviet posture, nor be pushed by Soviet desires into an uncritically supportive position. Our position should be one which appreciates the realities and the complexities of the bipolar world in which we live. It must argue in favor of all the positive achievements that Armenians have made without fear of censure by Americans that we are soft on communism. And at the same time, it must make clear our discontent with and our opposition to all restrictions on national, cultural, and individual freedom within the Soviet Union without fear and disapproval by Soviet authorities. This is an independent position. It's a position, I would argue, which is both supportive of Armenia and critical of limitations on our national life a critically supportive position, if you will. This is neither the unquestioning hostility that characterized the Cold War period or the Tashnak party at certain points, nor the uncritically supportive whitewash position which unfortunately uh, characterized certain left-wing Armenian organizations in the 30s and 40s. Such a position would require, of course, learning what we can about the Soviet Republic of Armenia, about Soviet history and politics, the genesis and development of Soviet experience in, Ar in Armenia, the disappointments and the successes. It demands that Armenian Americans be prepared to intervene in whatever way possible into the American political process to push for a foreign policy, which is not only anti-Turkish, that seems very limited to me, but which emphasizes and underscores the potential for peaceful and fruitful dealings with the Soviet Union. Indeed, I go back to my earlier statement, these are hard times for Armenians. But I believe that we can do much to prevent the situation from deteriorating further. It may mean swimming against the present current in foreign policy in America. And such a task is never easy for a minority. But I believe that the alternative is far worse. A new Cold War can very easily lead to a hot war. A hot war can, against the best intentions of the most far-sighted leaders in our nuclear age, destroy the world. We are today watching as societies such as Iran and Lebanon tear themselves apart in civil war. It's not unimaginable that the jingoist statements of American officials and the paranoia of Soviet leaders could lead to the all-out final struggle. Just, to, just uh, last year, President Reagan told a Bible-beating Southern senator that he believed that Armageddon would occur in the Middle East and that the Russians would be involved. The Middle East is, after all, where civilization began, and there are signs uh, every day that it could very well end there as well. All I've tried to say tonight is that we Armenians have a stake, a direct stake, in what happens in the Middle East and between the United States and the Soviet Union. I believe we should be working toward a cooling of the rhetoric between Washington and Moscow,
I believe that it is in our people's interest, both as Armenians and as Americans, that the current tensions between East and West be resolved so that both parts of our nation can once again come together and get on with our historic task of preserving our unique past and cultivating our national future. Thank you.